Welcome to A Word with Tom Merritt. I'm Tom Merritt. On this show, I have the pleasure and privilege of sitting down with some of the smartest, most interesting people in the world to talk about how we think. Because there's no way we could all know everything. So how we make our shortcuts that get us through life is important. And it's also good to compare notes on how we do that. Uh, these are the kinds of conversations that I've been having all my life. They're my favorite kind. I had them with my grandpa Carl in his front room, my grandma Roxy in her front room. I got lots of different ways of looking at the world and great conversations. And it was all leading me to this moment right now. Welcome into the front room, Eleanor Yanega. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Oh, it's it's a w- wonderful privilege to have you here. Thanks for 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 joining us. Uh for folks who don't already know you, uh tell tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh yeah, so I am a medieval historian for my sins. Um so I teach at the London School of Economics in the Department of International History. Um but I kind of got tired of just talking to like the same 20 medieval historians all the time. So I do now a lot more uh what we call public facing work. So you know, I write books for a general audience, I make TV shows, that sort of thing. I mean, basically if people are willing to sit down and listen to me ramble about medieval history, I will attempt to do so. That's wonderful. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine that one of the things you spend a lot of time in is is explaining to people what is and isn't medieval. <laughs> yes, uh, a frustratingly large amount of time because uh, one thing that I've kind of like learned throughout all of this is that people tend to think that the word medieval just means old. So, mm-hmm. you know, the, the number of times I've had to explain that, you know, like 1750 isn't medieval is is quite surprising. But a uh, general rule of thumb uh that is the medieval period You need to think about what the word itself means. So it literally means, you know, middle time, middle ages, right? That's that's where we get it. And by that, we mean it's kind of the bridge between the ancient world and the modern one. To be fair, this is a really kind of Eurocentric way of looking at the world. And, you know, things and ideas can vary all over the place. But from, you know, that kind of European point of view, what we say is that the medieval period starts in 476, which is the quote unquote fall of the Western Roman Empire, which you can tell from my spare quotes that medievalists are like, "Eh, I don't know about all that. But then you kind of go to the end of the medieval period. And that that's an interesting question, because no one really agrees on what that is. Uh, Because you could start off and you could say, uh, okay, well, the beginning of the medieval period is the reunification of Spain and the beginning of the Columbian Exchange. So 1492. Okay. Or you could say, oh, it starts um, with the fall of Constantinople, because if it starts with the fall of Rome, then Mm. it's the fall of Constantinople. So, you know, the 1450s, thereabouts, you know, if you're me and I do a lot of work on uh, Bohemian things, Czech things. And so I say, oh, it's the it's the Hussite Wars. And so, you know, it's, it's again, the kind of 14th century. And you could say, you know, it's Martin Luther. You could say that the predominant kind of overarching thing of the medieval period is the church. So by the time you've got Protestants, you know, say, I don't know, go ahead and say 1517, treat yourself. Uh, then, then that's the medieval period. But general rule of thumb is that if people are eating potatoes and tomatoes mm-hmm. and you can see Protestants, it's not medieval anymore. <laughs> so, that's so amazing. That's <laughs> uh, so Noki in a red sauce by a Lutheran, not medieval. <laughs> not medieval. You can't possibly be in the medieval period anymore. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> It, it, it's it's like it fa- it's like a fade out, right? Like mm, like mm. sometime toward f- towards the end of the 1300s into the 1500s, it's a slow fade out. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And and you know, and and that's kind of fair enough because really, ideas like this, you know, no one ever woke up one day and was like, oh, I guess we're medieval now, right? The the folks in, in Rome didn't say, oh, the Vandals are here. Get out the medieval yeah, calendar. That, not, yeah. that, that's it. It's it's done now. You know, like they they really kind of thought that they were just sort of continuing on. Yeah, yeah. Things, right. And I mean. I think that maybe the only possible difference there is that modern people at some point in time just did start saying, well, aren't we fairly modern? But, you know, I think it was a, a few hundred, you know, a few centuries past when it started being modern. So, you know. Everybody but, thinks they're modern, though, don't right? they? Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, I think that people really kind of have a thing. There, There is – I have to really struggle sometimes to be very, very careful when I'm writing about medieval people because sometimes I want to use the word modern. Mm-hmm. Like if people are doing something really new and exciting and they know it's new and exciting and they really like it. Right. Um, so, for example, uh, if you are into Gothic architecture, right, which kind of comes about at the first point in the high medieval period, 
So this is, this is annoying because medieval period then has like branches. You get your early, yeah, which goes yeah. up to about a thousand. Then you get your high, which is about a thousand to thirteen hundred. Where uh, humans, we like to slice things up. We like, yeah. we love it. We yeah. love it, right? So you, so you get to the high medieval period and people start making gothic buildings, you know, with all the lovely pointy arches mm-hmm. and all the gargoyles and everything. And they're like, got a new thing, huh? Like, you know, ooh, yeah. Yeah, and, and they're very excited about it. Right. And they start thinking about new ways to kind of like divide up cities and they're doing all these things that are that are terribly new. But we can't say, oh, yeah, they thought they were modern because they're just saying, oh, we've got something new and exciting. Right. So we're kind of lucky now because we've got a catch all word that does that. for uh, Yeah. So so they they thought they were modern, but they didn't know they could say they were modern because <laughs> there was no concept of modern. Is that- exactly. exactly. Yeah. If they knew the term modern. They would probably they would have used it. it but yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it, how does the term dark ages fit into any of this? Is is it even useful? Is it just slang? What it- so it's a really difficult one because uh, the term dark ages was originally invented uh, to talk about the period that we now call the early medieval period. But what we meant by it was that we don't have a lot of sources mm. left from it. Okay. So um, the original term for it is a saculum obscurum. Uh, and it was, it was uh, coined by this cardinal, a Caesar Baronius, uh, who made it up to be like, gosh, it's really hard to do my job here because there's just not as many sources. Um, and the reason that there aren't a lot of sources for it is it was a very long time ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is like stuff just that's, doesn't last it doesn't know? it's you know it, what we're talking about you know 1500 years ago yeah. and what i always say to people is like think about like when you move house you don't like keep every phone bill you ever got sent right you just like chuck it out so something has to be really really important to kind of make it through all of that and then also in a world that's you know fire is the way that you have light things caught on fire a lot so that yeah. that's a real issue so we just don't have sources so we made up the term dark ages to talk about that now Unfortunately, people who are not historians thought that what Dark Ages meant was that it was bad. Mm-hmm. The, dark uh, and, and that, the dark times and oh like what a terrible time that was. Uh-huh. Um, and, and indeed, like people now kind of think that it's interchangeable with medieval period, which in the first place it never was. It never was. It was only this kind of the slice. Just one right slice. At, okay. Yeah, just yeah, like yeah. right at the beginning. So it's like if you were talking about 1250, it's like, I'm sorry, but no, like absolutely not. That's this is a, a comparatively easy time to research, you know. Um so we now have kind of just like ejected it altogether, mostly because it's quite difficult to have a conversation with ordinary people about it. And like the term is basically ruined, right? Yeah. It was a useful term and now it isn't. So now I have to spend all of this time kind of being like, please don't use that because it's, it, it refers to that thing, you know, my, my wonderful catchphrase, it returned, it refers to a lack of sources and not intellectual decline. Do, do you and, call it early medieval then? Dude, or yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so okay. early medieval is one. So it's like you know you kind of have the late antique, which is sort of like right before Rome falls. Then you got early medieval. Then you've got high medieval, and then you've got late medieval. Did and it appear did. darker because Rome was better at keeping things, or because Rome had more good statues, or, or it, well, that? Yeah, it's a really <laughs> interesting one because uh, like part of it is um, really quite interestingly that medieval people love Rome. Like they really like Rome. And so if they find Roman stuff, they're like, ooh, Roman stuff, that's really good. You better keep, keep like don't don't oh, don't get rid okay. of that, you know. Uh-huh. But yeah. if it's their own stuff, they're like, I don't who cares? Yeah, like, I, we I don't need care what that light that on yeah. fire. Yeah. Who cares what like Gunda Purges thinks, you know, like get rid uh, of that, you know. Okay. But yeah, if it was yeah. Roman, everyone is like, Oh, that's good. That mm-hmm. that'll be nice, you know. So there's also this quite interesting thing where they've got a real reverence for the antique period they've got a huge reverence for rome they're constantly trying to convince everybody that they are kind of like the new iteration of rome and for them that's incredibly important and it's a way of proving that your ideas are important or that you should be listened to is if you can connect yourself to rome in any way shape or form so they're like we've got to have this stuff around the shop right but if it's you know you kind of consolidating monasteries and you've got like 17 copies of the same book you're like eh, get rid of 16 and we'll keep one you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I do that with myself when I'm, you mm-hmm. know, going through my closet and throwing stuff out. I'll be like, mm-hmm. oh, nobody cares about this. And then 15 years later, it'll turn out like somebody will be like, do you still have that thing? And I'll be like, uh, no, uh, I wish I would have kept it, you know. Yeah. The number of times I've done that with band t shirts now that the 90s right. are back. Yeah. I'm like, I yeah. Because really, everything I've, comes I've, back. Yeah. 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 It's very, very annoying. Right. <laughs> Was, is there something about Rome that, made people give it an exception is it because it fell so fast was it just like a a local high point do you why why that one versus egypt babylon you know well okay so it's quite 
That's a great question. And I mean, uh, part of it is uh, that, so in the first place, that you know, they still love Greeks and Egyptians too. They're like, that's that's great. I sure, mean, sure. Medieval, medieval people will never tire of talking about Aristotle. And so actually it can be quite annoying <laughs> because, you know, when, when you're a medievalist, you have to know, like, it, it's, it's not very fair. You have to kind of like know all the ancient stuff and you have to know all the medieval stuff. It's too much. It's too much. Uh, so you have to be really good at Plato. You've got to be really good at Aristotle. You've got to know your Cicero because this is the sort of stuff they teach, you know, in universities. And this is what monks are talking about and writing about. Um, so that's, you know, part of it. But Rome has kind of a bigger statute for them because they connect it with Christianity. And so obviously mm. medieval Europe is quite Christian, you know, there are, there's exceptions to this, like the Iberian Peninsula very famously has rather a lot of Muslims, rather, rather a lot of Jewish people. Uh, same thing for places like Sicily, like very, very mixed society, that sort of thing. And you also have places, you know, like what they call Ifriqiya at the time. So, you know, Egypt, um, El what is now Algeria, places like that, um, where, you know, they have varying thoughts. But for them, the idea is that Rome is kind of this empire which backs the church up. Right. And the church is sort of good. So Rome is not even necessarily like about the city. So a lot of people are kind of like trying to position themselves as kind of the next Rome, which is how you get um, the Holy Roman Empire. Right. Right. Uh, well, and, when, and you get yeah. you get Constantinople and you get Avignon mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, everybody's oh, like, yeah. well, well, Rome can be wherever we want it to be. Right. Well, the thing about Constantinople is if you ask a person in Constantinople in the medieval period, you know, now we call them Byzantine. They never use that word. They, they would say, yeah, we're the Eastern Roman Empire because mm. that's what established them. You know, yeah, the, the yeah. Roman Empire got split into two bits and they kept going. So it's, you know, when I say like the fall of the Roman Empire, it's like, well, what does that mean? Because it looks like the Roman Empire is still going over there. Like, you know, they're having chariot races and right, right. giant, giant riots that can kill 10,000 people because that's how Roman they are over there yeah. right um so it, and it all it always strikes me how recent the holy roman empire was a real mm, thing too yeah right? we we think of germany as having always been there but it's pretty new no. yeah and and i'm so i i'm a holy roman imperial specialist i'm obsessed with the holy roman empire because i think it's it's so interesting because it actually really worked for a really long time and you know now the way that we we think about things the way that we think about uh nationality and nationhood right where it's like oh well a lot of it is really linked to language a lot of it is really linked to culture uh but for them that's not what was going on they were like eh, you know kind of the best way to run things is you have kind of like local dioceses that are sort of doing their own thing like in each of these smaller states but then you've got an overarching structure of an empire which isn't actually that different to kind of like for example america mm -hmm. now although all those states are, are much larger um but but it's it, a federation it's, kind of yeah yeah pretty much so it's like it's it's complicated because like the you you elect the holy roman empire mm -hmm. emperor uh and, and, and well not you don't seven people do so, <laughs> so the, the, the prince imperial electors so the you electors get, you get there, right? yeah, yeah you get you get three archbishops and you got uh, four princes to kings to count um kind of guys and they get to say uh who the holy roman emperor is going to be and then after he is elected he becomes king of the romans and then after that happens in theory the pope crowns him and then he is the holy roman emperor um in practice a lot of the time the popes will be like i don't feel like it today <laughs> and uh, and kind of uh, they, and they will string this out for years upon years upon years just to get you know would be emperors to do what it is they want to do was was so, it uh god god has not uh inspired me yet Did it, was there yeah, an element of that to it more or less because there's it's it, it caused an ongoing thing throughout the medieval period that we call the it's called the papal imperial rivalry. yeah yeah um and so the popes say well the reason that you are the emperor is because i said so um and their idea is that um the office of Holy Roman Emperor exists because the church can't wield violence, right? So the, you're not allowed to be doing anything violent. So when something violent needs to happen, say, for example, the Crusades, or I, mean, mm -hmm. I don't know, they don't like the look of that guy and they want some more land, you know, th that kind of thing. They are then supposed to be able to tap the Holy Roman Emperor and then he'll go do that for them. Mm -hmm. is is sort of the idea there right um, the emperors are like ha ha <laughs> i don't think that that's strictly true sir and i'm pretty sure that i was elected to this position and you know you need to crown me when i said so and you know indeed the first time an, em an emperor ever got crowned was charlemagne and that was just his idea he thought it would be something nice 
uh, because the the Pope wasn't very important. He did it for his kids. Yeah, Yeah, basically. He was all like, you like that? Got the Pope. (laughs) And, you know, in 800, when that happened, the Pope wasn't a very important guy at all whatsoever. And it was just a kind of like little flourish. Mm. But then, you know, 300 years later, you know, popes have written enough about how important they are that they've basically created this mythos and created like the offices of the church into this big legal juggernaut that it becomes real. So, uh, you you know, this is one of the things that I'm, I'm obsessed with medieval history because you can watch people, you know, write themselves sort of into creation and write their positions of power into being, um, in this very real way. And now it it takes hundreds of years, sure, but you know, it already happens. So I can collapse time really easily (laughs) when I'm talking about it, you know? Yeah. I, I think what confuses people is that they hear the word Holy Roman Empire and they think, oh, so it's it's a leftover bit of Rome, mm-hmm. but it, it's Germany, right? Like, yeah, it's well, it's it's quite interesting because it's sometimes it's bits of France. Uh-huh, um, so, uh-huh. Sometimes it's bits of uh, northern Italy. Um, it's usually Switzerland. Um, it's often anywhere they speak German, but. At the beginning of it, uh, the Austrians aren't involved sometimes, and sometimes they are. Uh, it's Czech people. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, sometimes Hungarians. You know, it's uh, so you, you kind of um, it's, it's a big slice lowlands. of Central Europe that just kind of shifts around. Then, yeah, it does. So it, it really moves um, over time, and well, and it, clu- it includes like the Netherlands and Belgium and places like that that are very, very uh, economically important in the medieval period. Like some of the most important part of Europe is up there. So it's. It, it comprises all these areas and a lot of the area that was most kind of like economically powerful, not counting France. It's kind of like the big, the big powerhouses are sort of like France and the Holy Roman Empire at the time. Um, and, you know, yeah, sometimes it's all of Italy except the Papal States. Like sometimes they've got Sicily and the boots, sometimes they don't. Mm-hmm. But for them, being Roman doesn't have anything to do with Rome necessarily. It's more of a vibe. And that vibe is about being Catholic. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's the same way that you'll say, like, the Holy Roman Catholic Church. It's like, well, okay, but if you are, for example, you know, a Catholic in Nigeria, which is very common, what's Rome got to do with this other than that's where the boss lives, right? Right, But but it's still still the Roman Catholic Church. So was there a capital of the Holy Roman Empire or – it moves around depending on who's in charge mm-hmm. is the answer. So uh, when Charlemagne did it, although that's technically not the Holy Roman Empire, that's technically uh, Carolingian, it was in Aachen. Um, in Sometimes it will be in Bavaria. If the, the guys like it's called your Hausmacht it, it is like the it, you, where your power comes from in your okay. own land. So you'll often have it there. Um, when my guy that I work on, Charles IV, is uh, in charge in the, thir- the 14th century, like the 1300s, it's in Prague. Um, so it moves around, but then eventually at the very end of the medieval period, and then when it turns into the early modern period, um, the Habsburgs get hold of it and it starts to become instead of um, an elected position. It's just, uh, it's just hereditary like anywhere else. Um, And then eventually you get the seat tied to Vienna. So I've always felt like it's a great example, uh, of how we want to try to see history in our modern terms, to use mm. modern again, uh, as as national in a mm. time when it wasn't national. Does is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And you know, you start getting like you you start getting inklings of nationality at, at interesting times. So, um, and in the Holy Roman Empire, there'll be kind of grumblings about this. So, for example, you'll have Czechs grumbling. That mm-hmm. like Germans aren't paying enough attention to them, and there, and you know, there's attempts to rectify this. Like at a point in time, Charles the Fourth makes this this uh, document called the Bull, the Golden Bull, uh, and in it he says, and everyone who's a prince elector has to learn Czech because we're tired ta- we're tired of you Germans pushing us essentially, right? Uh-huh. Like you should not you should not be speaking Czech really, um, and everyone's like, yeah, sure, buddy, yeah, we're we're uh-huh. getting right on that, you know, like any any minute now. Um, so you get some sort of like grumblings here and there about people not liking it, but you know if if you look over at like France and England, for example, half the time the English king is going down to France to pay homage to the king of France because he's also like the vassal of France because right. he owns, you know, if he doesn't think he is the king of and, France, he's paying homage. It sounded yeah, like, yeah. right. Like exactly. And, and so it's kind of like the, the, this idea that, you know, somebody is like, you know, that that where you're born is really kind of like an intrinsic part of your being and that you've got a nationality that you're part of just doesn't exist in the same way. Uh, they'll talk a lot about languages used and they kind of like talk about linguistic groups. Um, and you can see, as I say, you can see the stirrings, but it's just not there yet. And it's not the way that they see you should really organize society. They, they don't see it as useful. 
yeah, I, I find it hard to wrap my head around uh, to, to understand what it meant to live in France when it wasn't France. It, was, there, yeah. it wasn't like a nice, bright orange thing on the map with lines around it. Right. And mm. did did and who thought of themselves as French, if anyone, then? Uh, well, it, it, this or is did you think part. of yourself as Parisian or, or whatever city you were so, from? So the French are frustrating because they're one of the ones where they they're kind of like the so first so one. Many who's, they, they sort of have like, a, yeah, right. But. God bless them. Uh, I, you know, I like a lot of their books. They, they, they've done good things. You know? I have, I have uh, a very good French friend. Uh, so when I make fun of the French, I'm always making fun of Patrick Beja. <laughs> uh, there you go. In your face, Patrick. But um, yeah, they're an interesting one because they do have one of the first kind of like coalesced kingdoms where it's like, you know, there's this idea where you really are under like the King of France and you go do homage to him. So it's kind okay. of like the storybook uh, thing that we tell about feudalism, which never really existed in, in that way, kind of does in France because you got you got to go kneel at his feet, you got to kiss the ring, and all these things. But it's not what we think of as France now. It's kind of like I don't know, like the bits around Paris, so like Orléans, mm-hmm. Cousy, you know, you know, places like that, where it's the, like, oh yeah, the we're, Ile we're, de France. Yeah, the Ile de France, the places like that, they'll be like, oh yes, we are French, you know. But mm-hmm. if you go down south, you know, they they will be like, yes, well, hello, you are in, you know, the Languedoc region, right, right, and then like we're speaking Occitan. And, you know, like we're we're we've got like a whole different language down here. So don't know what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. Um, and you might be under the auspices of the French king, but they don't necessarily think of themselves as French. And it's not until the early modern period when the French king says, no, I'm sorry, you're all speaking French now. We're we're rec- we're we're bringing this all into like one level that that starts happening. Um, and so like Normans, like now, like a Bretons, like uh, if you're like me and you enjoy uh, the sport of professional cycling. Any professional cycling race you're at, there'll be a guy with a Breton flag there. Uh huh. Like, and, and the, like, this is a whole thing with them where they're like, no, well, we're Breton. And you're like, okay, like, I enjoy your cider. Thanks. Nice work. <laughs> you know, great. But, but the, like these, there's still these kind of vestiges, these little things that kind of survive there. You know? Right. Well, and, and I always think of, of Spain as sort of not mm. quite out of that era, right? Because you still oh, have, yeah. uh, Castile, uh, mm-hmm. tr- you know, with a legitimate separatist movement where the, the the president of or the governor, I guess I, I can't remember the title, got thrown in jail for yeah. for pushing a separatist vote. There's the Basques, the Basques, yeah, yeah. So, who are kind of like I'm sorry, what like once again entirely different language, yeah, you know, yeah. different different region, and um, you know it's kind of it's one where you have to be really careful when you think about the history of Spain as well because the idea of like you know the Reconquista, for example, which mm-hmm. is like, you know, like the idea that you know eventually Christians took back over and pushed out all the hated Muslims, you know that was one that was really advanced by Franco very specifically. And, mm. you know, that was a term that was come up with like under a fascist government. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I try to be very careful and mindful of that and be like, ah, yeah, the unification of <laughs> and then other monkeys are just I, I'm like, I don't want to give the fascists that, you know. I've, but, every once in a while I've had somebody uh, email me trying to to push the idea that there is no such thing as a Spanish language. It's it's a Madrid mm. language versus Castilian. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I'm sympathetic to the argument, but I'm like, yeah, Yes, but that's no different than French. That's no different than English. The, English, you, you right, know, yeah. we, we have the same thing everywhere. So you you may be right, but I'm not sure if it's useful to be right in that mm. in those cases. Yeah, I mean, and I suppose that within that, there's kind of this question, and I'm, and I'm quite sympathetic, you know, like, I, like again, as a person who works on, you know, Czech things, and, you know, it came, like, mm-hmm. you know, the... The, the story of kind of like, you know, Czechs and Slovaks emerging out from the Holy Roman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire is, is one of like really, uh, really pointed resistance to kind of, you know, you know, linguistic overlords to a certain extent. But, you know, it, it, it's kind of like at, at what point in time do we slice a do we slice things too slit? Like how thin can the salami go? Right. You right. know, it, it's sort of the thing. And I, and I don't doubt it. Um but I just think that we also need to, and I think we need to be really respectful of these things. And I think it's really useful to see the the history behind it. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, at a point in time, well, I'm a, you know originally from America and I speak English. Right. And if, if I don't English. call it, it, it's it's I, you're absolutely right. I I feel like it's right to be respectful of that. But at the same time, I'm not going to stop calling it Spanish mm-hmm. because people won't mm-hmm. know what I mean. Exactly. 
it's an interesting one within the, the Spanish context as opposed to like the context of the Americans, right? Mm-hmm. Because you know that we have all these really interesting you know dialectics of um, of Spanish within the Americas, obviously, yeah. uh, and, and you know like I'm a, I'm a Spanish speaker as well, you know, as you know most a lot of people born in the Americas are, um, and it's kind of turned into now that I live in Europe, it's kind of turned into Spanish Spanish, but I have kind of a, a weird accent um, as a result of it. But I have all this Mexican slang. Right. Uh-huh. From growing up in the States. And so people are always kind of like, what? You know, like, I think that I get a lot of so people will be like, are you Argentinian? And I'm like, did you just call my grandparents Nazis? <laughs> Come on, man. Like, cause, cause, you know, like, a I'm lot just, of baggage of that. Yeah, yeah. Man, like, yeah, what, what's going on here? But, you know, we, we have like, so for example, even though I'm a Spanish speaker and I use it all the time, um, I still have to listen very carefully. For example, when I hear Dominican Spanish or Cuban Spanish, mm-hmm. I have to be like, okay, like, I'm, I'm paying attention now. Because uh, they have such a, a really great drawl. They've got all this, this uh, slang that I'm not used to. And so I have to really kind of like mind my toes. Whereas if it's someone from, yeah, you know, Madrid, like that person yeah. was saying, I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah, whatever. Like, I don't have to, I could be down the hallway going, what? Behind the <laughs> counter, you know, yeah, and it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Well, know? I I learned uh, Spanish first in uh, elementary school. Because uh, I, I grew up in Southern Illinois, and there was a, ah. a small uh, four-year liberal arts college called Greenville College, and they mm-hmm. sent uh, exchange students over to the elementary school to teach foreign languages. So I was one of the people who was selected to learn Spanish from this woman from Madrid. Uh, and so oh. that's how I learned my, my first Spanish. Later in life, I moved to Texas. And I can get by. I, I yeah. sort of, you know, I'd hear people speaking Spanish and I'm like, follow the gist. But I was like, man, my Spanish is just so rusty. Uh, mm. And then one day I was working at a bookstore in Austin uh, and these these people came in and they were speaking Spanish and I understood everything they said. And I was mm-hmm. like, what is going on? They came up to check out and I was like, where are you from? And they're like, oh, we're from we're from Spain. I don't remember if they were from Madrid or not, but I was like, mm. oh, that's why. Because I grew up learning that version of it and exactly it, yeah and i'm i'm hearing an accent and didn't even realize it yeah and, and it is one of those funny things where I, I do tend to think that when you have kind of like second language uptake um you forget that there's accents mm-hmm. right you kind of just go oh well it's a language and you can dive right in and you know anyone who's ever heard like quebecois french would be like hmm. <laughs> you yeah, know yeah, about yeah. that i mean shout out shout out to the quebecois great great bunch of people absolutely yeah no, yeah. no notes but you know it, it it can be trickier you know and um you know i say this as like not a french speaker just emphatically <laughs> I, I can like, order I can... a beer in montreal that's about the extent yeah. of my french yeah you know what i got restaurant french it's fine yeah, and yeah. I, can, I can read things for my job like i can read about medieval history really effectively but if you want me to like get up and give a speech it's, just, it's not gonna happen <laughs> it's just not you know so. well, I'm, I'm trying to learn korean right now oh uh and sometimes i will hear people uh on, on shows i watch speaking in korean making fun of their dialects and they're mm. like yeah i'm gonna do a daegu dialect and i'm like they they all sounds exactly the same right okay I, like, i'm waiting for the day that i can tell the difference you know where it, when it snaps yeah i have this thing where because I, I lived in tokyo for for a while and um i've got this thing where if i'm not paying attention um and like something comes on in korean i'll be like oh my god my just my japanese is so rusty i've lost it all like oh there it's great it's <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah you know and then i'll just like feel like completely like an idiot for for 15 minutes so well that yeah. that's fascinating too because i learned uh i took russian and college College. Mm. Uh, and people will always talk about Korean being one of the hardest languages to learn. Mm. And I realized that a lot of the grammar of Russian that is so difficult is similar to the grammar in Korean. Oh, does it decline? Uh, and 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 the and yet the the words and, and everything are all borrowed from Chinese and, and shared mm. with Japanese and everything. So I don't have a whole lot of cognates unless they're borrowed English mm. words. Uh, but the 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 word order, I'm like, oh, no, I, I, I get this. I, I get this sort of like oh. it, it's different in that they put the verbs at the end like the Japanese and, and Chinese do. OK, yeah, 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 yeah. but there's a lot of the like, oh, the ending of the word is going to serve the purpose of what would be articles in English. Okay, no, oh, so that makes sense to me. So yeah, you know, Latin, you know, Latin does this, Czech does this. I've got like some Russian, but it kind of just all turned into Czech. Yeah, because uh, so, I, I, <laughs> I sort of that. stopped using it, and and I was like, eh, you know. So now I can like understand seventy percent of what Russians are saying, and then be like, 
I'm just guessing. But, but you know, they, they, yeah, they, they all do that thing of having, you know, uh, the declining so that the nouns and everything kind of tell you what it is that they're doing. Right, right. And when, yeah. you're, when you're learning it, especially like as an English speaker, because we don't have any of that, right? It, it can be sort of confusing. But I think that actually it's quite comforting if you mm. get used to it as as a learner because you words are telling you what they want mm-hmm. and and that's quite nice so if even if you don't necessarily know the word you'll at least kind of understand you know what the ending is and you're like oh it's doing this in the sentence so therefore like what could what could it possibly be in context and then that 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 can help you out i think yeah so. yeah it, it, it's it's fun to learn from for me it's fun to to learn even little bits of other languages because you just get insight into different ways of expressing things that your mm-hmm. language isn't capable of you know that you oh, have yeah. to work so hard so much harder it, maybe it's capable of it but you you have to use so many more words yeah, I think if I, I would say that if I was a billionaire, that like the thing that I would do is I would just like sit around and learn languages all day. Just like, soak them up. Yeah. Yeah. It would be really fun, you know, and yeah. I, I would be learning, I'd be learning really esoteric stuff. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. Uh, and it would be really fun. I, I'd, I'd be on Mongolian, Dravidian, and Basque. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Like I, I would be like all the minority languages. I'd be like, I'm there. It's going to be fantastic. So, yeah. 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 You know, bringing it back to the medieval for a second, because I, I, I thought of this earlier too. Uh, is there an equivalent of medieval in non-European histories? So this is quite an interesting one because the answer is sort of yes, uh, but it really differs. So uh, for instance, in um, the, like China, what is considered the medieval period ends way before <laughs> like mm-hmm. the European one. So you kind of uh, basically, as far as they are concerned, you are done uh, with kind of like the 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 chinese stuff by like the i think that that it's something like the 11th century they're like no we're modern now Mm -hmm. like like Mm -hmm. that's it and and so and they base it on a varying dynasties um and that sort of thing so they're and and to be fair part of what's going on there is that they are just like way more um they they have what we call just kind of like a higher standard of living generally Mm -hmm. um than a lot of people do in europe now i don't want to fall into this trap some people are like oh yeah everyone in medieval europe didn't bathe and everyone was with just and and like it's it's just that's not true that's simply not true it's just that um china was just a little bit more quote-unquote advanced in certain things like technologies um they definitely had a more kind of uh stable state over like over structure you know they they Mm -hmm. had you know empires that would kind of like control things and keep things relatively stable for long periods of time so that really helped out um and then so this kind of creates what we eventually end up calling um the high equilibrium trap where it's kind of like where i gotta be you know right like whereas the thing is you know europeans were like very eager to get on a ship and sail somewhere because you know we didn't have gold Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. you know we didn't have we didn't have certain things like that whereas chinese people were like i don't know we're living pretty fine yeah why 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 we need to go get anything else the emperor gives us everything we need yeah and and it's you know obviously there's people that are poor within the structure i'm not i'm not saying that there aren't but things are going kind of well there um you see kind of a really similar thing in you know what is now india uh where they've got like really high standards of living things are are really really quite good and you know it it sort of takes like british imperialism to really like knock that on the head it's like no you people are living too fine we're have you have you tried opium you know (laughs) this kind of thing so uh you know that doesn't really stop until quite late actually, um, in the modern period. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, but we're also kind of trying to broaden out more generally and talk about more what we're calling kind of the global medieval. Mm. And what we, we, you, what we're kind of saying for that is that, well, you know, you can think about it as though there is a kind of like bridge to the modern world for everyone. If we kind of think about the modern world as being typified by, uh, like, constant um and ongoing trade and movement back forth and forth everywhere right because you do see contact for example between like asia and the americas like yeah, up, yeah. up around like russia and alaska like of course like they're, they're back and forth all the time you know trading things like that's that's fine like that's no, no big deal but it's not intensive you mm-hmm, know in, in mm-hmm. the same sort of way and of course you also have stuff like uh, the polynesians who get around and have like incredible tech you know which like my god you know the, the how wonderful these people were at sailing and just kind of like moving around the ocean it's that, that's incredible. one of the great tragedies of history is is when i read about uh, a, a culture it, you usually in in south pacific that that didn't preserve their navigational history to the yeah. point where it's like they they don't 
they don't know how they got there, sort of. Like they they know they did and they know the stories, but they don't know the tech. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it, it's such a really, really interesting kind of lacuna that we've, mm-hmm. we've got there. And, uh, you know, it can be really instructive as well, because we know that they got there. We know they must have had the tech because there they are, right? Yeah. But that's really quite similar to, for example, you know, the Dark Ages over in Europe, where we're like, huh. You know, what was going on where, 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 where we don't have all these texts? And it's like, well, we know that they've got X, Y, and Z at the end of it. So what kind of happened in between? And right. that's the frustrating thing about being a historian, right? We're, we're reliant on written documents. Um, of course, you know, our friends in archaeology, they can just go dig stuff up. But you sure. can't dig up, you know, like the, somebody's a mental map of the stars. Right. right? So, you know, my, my point being that now we're, we're starting to move towards saying, like, this is all like one one way of looking at history um, and we can start kind of thinking about a global middle ages if we just kind of accept that there's if we just accept that maybe it goes a little bit later mm-hmm. maybe it begin, you know maybe it begins at different points it's, a, and, it's you know, like a wave kind of mm-hmm. yeah exactly so it's like you know uh for example maybe it goes on a little longer in australasia mm-hmm. you know and, and places like that and there's i think part of that though and a really important thing that we need to kind of like get away from is thinking about uh using the word medieval as pejorative mm-hmm. and and that's kind of like the trouble that we have is oh, that a lot of people everyone when i told them mm-hmm. i was doing this interview asked me if you would get medieval on something yes or other. and the answer yeah. is yes yeah yes i will um and by that i mean i'm going to construct a really uh long-winded uh etymological case for it you know based on <laughs> With a lot of gold leaf and- <laughs> yeah exactly so uh that, that's what i'm going to do uh, but uh it's it's frustrating uh y- you know because I spent all this time kind of having to defend the medieval period and we shouldn't have to do that because we shouldn't be thinking about time periods as being necessarily superior to one or the other. And it'll kind of like open up, I think our ability to, to talk about the medieval world or think about the medieval world as this really complex, interesting and, and indeed interconnected uh, place. If we stop thinking that like modernity is necessarily, Oh, that's good. Right. Right. Without, making it uh, a matter of superiority and inferiority mm. what is the defining characteristic of medieval versus renaissance romantic modern etc oh that's a that's a great question i'm kind of in the middle of uh, writing a book about the renaissance at the moment which is uh, you know predicated on the fact that the the renaissance is like a, a, an infomercial to sell art uh, <laughs> and and it's it's not really real um, uh-huh. but, but uh you know a lot of it is vibes right because it's like oh well, this is this is renaissance now and you know when you, when you talk about the renaissance it can get super confusing especially with renaissance people because essentially they're like if some gut buddy was italian and they like the thing it's Renaissance. Like I've heard Dante called Renaissance, and I'm like, you guys. <laughs> like it's, it's he's got another like 300 years. Like calm down, you know. But it basically, a lot of the the time, what happens is that if someone is Italian and somebody thinks a piece of art they made is good, it's like suddenly, uh, da da, it's Renaissance. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any bloody sense at all. Like as you know, a, a category, in my opinion. But I suppose, you know, this is the thing about, you know, trying to say when the medieval period ended. And I suppose that, like, within Europe, what you can say about it is it's like, yeah, you still got, you don't have Protestants, you still got Constantinople. Mm-hmm. That That's what it is, um, you know, in... Is, is there less technology during that no, there's, there, there's plenty of tech and you get really interesting, like, tech Because people always think of, like, oh, the, the roads and the aqueducts went away. Like, yeah. It, which it's like, you know, in the first place, a lot of them stayed. Uh, uh-huh. but in, the, yeah. in, the, in the second place, um, it's quite funny because medieval people come up with all this great tech that um, Romans didn't have. Uh-huh. So, for example, uh, medieval Europeans move into places that Romans couldn't live. Right. So medieval people develop a, a really important invention. It, see, people don't want to talk about it because a lot of them are farming. Mm. And uh, people think that farming isn't cool. Farming Boring. is actually incredibly cool. Yeah. Farming is very cool. Believe <laughs> me, I know. I grew up in Illinois. Yeah. It's, it's cool, right? And uh, so the first thing that they do is they come up with a heavy plow. Mm-hmm. And the heavy plow allows you to dig the uh, kind of heavier soils of Northern Europe. So what the more kind of clay-based soils that you get in, you know, for example, the German lands, places like that. Um, they also have major advancements in terms of draining things. So that's how you get the lowlands. So like what is now the Netherlands, what is now Belgium. 
they just bring whole big chunks of land out of the sea and they go, okay, we're going to run sheep through this now. Fantastic. You know, like th- this is what we're going to do. Um, they come up with a three field system, which allows you to always be farming things um, and never have a period where your crops completely collapse. That's a really big deal. Um, they come up with stuff like eye surgery. There are really big kind of um, advancements in, you know, the medical fields in general. Uh, an interesting thing that people tend to, to think that um, I run into all the time is for some reason, people are convinced that uh, the ancient world had workable medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's just based on the fact that they like aqueducts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so and so they're like, oh, these guys had aqueducts. They must have known what germs are. And I'm like, guys, you know, so when you hear people talk about, for example, humoral theory, you know, like you've got. You, you've got four humors in your body blood black bile yellow bile mm-hmm. and um oh gosh what's the what's the third? Uh, phlegm there you go uh, and th- then they have to stay in balance that's an that's an ancient greek theory that's like you know hippocrates came up with it you know this is this is old as old as old and you know sure medieval people didn't get rid of it but we didn't get rid of it until like the 19th century yeah, yeah but yeah. for some reason medieval people are the ones where everyone's like you guys are stupid you Leeches. believed in that yeah and, and it's like what's Everybody believed that for a really long, you know, so, but you do have advancements on that. You do have kind of like more movements towards um, observable medicine. Um, you get in the medieval people, at, in the medieval people, in the medieval period, you get um, movements towards doing more dissections, things like mm-hmm. that, uh, because there's like pro, there's prescriptions against it in the Roman Empire and stuff. There's like worries that if you open a body up, um, it will spread contagion. Uh, so you don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and also mm-hmm. it makes the gods bad. Whereas, you know, varying places will, you know, sometimes ban human dissection in the medieval period, but it's kind of rolling. Mm-hmm. And at certain places, like, for example, the Holy Roman Empire will actually say, no, we have to have a certain number of dissections every year because we need to keep our physicians well trained. Hmm. So they have more movements towards kind of like observe medicine, things like that. So a lot of things like that happen. But, you know, it's it's just slower. And we tend to say that that must be bad because you know a lot of us remember the 20th century when things were just going bang 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 and now we're on the moon and hey now we've got x you know and and it just everything moved very very quickly but that's not how the world worked and it's not how the world worked in the roman period and it's not how you know the world worked for egyptians you know and these things all kind of like moved a little bit more slowly but people certainly were building on that all the time it's just it's not rapid fire and that's nobody's fault it, it it feels like maybe a way to uh, to define medieval is it's more of a shift of power mm. than it is you know a decline of anything. That's really apt, I think, and it's one of the ways that I like to kind of think about it because I think that one of the other reasons that we tend to kind of think about medieval as a pejorative is you know we live we live in a real imperial world you know like mm-hmm. uh, you know here we are as Americans which is you know a big old empire right. And so we have a real vested interest in upholding periods where empires are as being necessarily better. Yeah. I think it was the British who really liked that idea first. And then we picked it up from them. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, like look at all the look at all the, uh, you know, capital buildings and everything in America that are like fake Roman and fake Greek, you know, and and really specifically calling out to this period of time and saying that this is what's good. And this is the thing that you want to emulate. But what the medieval period really shows us is that actually you can have really sophisticated and useful ways of doing government that are smaller. And, you know, it's okay to have a, a little group of lad that's, you know, granted, I'm, I'm not I'm not selling you that I'm like big on monarchies right now. That's not my point. <laughs> You're not but pushing I, for neo-feudalism or anything. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I've, I've just already had to live through the Queen's death. It's all very yeah, yeah, yeah. strange over here at the moment. Um, So... I, but I do think that there is something to be said for smaller groups of people and smaller regions kind of determining what their own needs are and that being reacted to on a smaller scale. And we tend to kind of like push that aside and say that it can't possibly be useful. It can't be a good way of running the world. Uh, but it's just because it's not like how things are now, I think. So, yeah, if you... Mm-hmm. One way of looking at it is saying that, you know, the medieval world just has lots of smaller groups that you know interact just on smaller scales and there's nothing wrong with that more local control Mm -hmm. even though there was some absolute monarchy you know Mm -hmm. rising out of it uh still yeah i i've always liked the idea of the monarchy uh, Mm -hmm. in the in the budget sense of uh, a thing to distract everyone (laughs) so that so that you don't have to respect government you can respect the figurehead instead Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, but I've always thought of that as a more modern 
uh, uh, thing. Is is there an element of that in medieval too, where people are like, yeah, yeah, we're the low, we'll have our local control. You go be king over there in your kingy place, and, oh, and that's fine. That definitely happens. You know, it's a, oftentimes. Um, so you know, that's kind of you know a big way actually that you get the Habsburgs in the Holy Roman Empire is that they would kind of like choose the people who they thought were the weakest, and mm. they'd be like, yeah, look, you're the emperor, huh? <laughs> like, go go over there and do not pay attention to what is happening. You huh. know, in 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 my ducal lands. You know, I'm I'm very busy. Oh, are you having fun? Ooh, nice hat. You know, and then they they go back to doing what it is that they want to do. Um, and you know, you do see this kind of over and over again. You know, um, I don't like to go on about Magna Carta because it's not that important actually, uh, because all it does is reaffirm things as they already were in England. But the point of it is, it reaffirms the fact that, like the king, yeah, the king is a guy, mm -hmm. you know. But you know, barons have really rather a lot of say over their own guy. even lands. John. <laughs> yeah, even John, right? You know. Who, it's quite funny that you, you know, the way that we now kind of like look at Magna Carta, which is Americans' fault largely. This idea that Magna Carta is really important. We did mm. that uh, because, you know, something, something, the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, we needed paper. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, all it did was, you know, reaffirm rights that were already there. Mm -hmm. You know, which is, and you know, the fact that like the barons are immensely powerful people. There's like 25 guys that kind of run the country, but arguably, you know, what we, we've got real problems now in the UK with, you know, basically all the money is here in London. Um, and, you know, you can go to, for example, like up in the Northwest and, you know, things are really kind of ignored and they, people aren't treated as though they're, they're really important mm -hmm. a lot of the time. And, you know, in a lot of ways, isn't it better to, kind of have a local baron that like at least knows what's going on yeah, yeah. you know it, it, to a certain extent i would say that there there is an argument to be made for you know these smaller duchies and things like that because at least those people care because if their communities aren't working well they can't tax them right right, right. so you it, it's to your interest to kind of like protect your small folks keep things ticking over at least and and that is a way of doing things. Now, you know, I'm always team surf. I'm always team peasant. But like, I, I, I want to be exceedingly clear on that. But, you know, as things go, if what we're talking about is you have to have a system wherein, like, some guy is born with magic blood and now he rules, you know, that it's better. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. I, I, local, local representation with a little modern uh, accountability and, yeah. and, and local voice mix. Elections. In. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, th things of this nature. Right. And, and you do I, see this. I'll be honest. Know? I pay my property tax and I think, gosh, I'm sure glad I don't live in an era where the land is actually owned by the king and I have to pay rent to keep it. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. <laughs> That's what oh. property tax feels like. Oh, mate, here in the UK, we have uh, this system that nowhere else in the world has uh, that it's called uh, like the freehold system. Oh, right. So, I've heard about this. Yeah. Yeah. So you can own your, like, we would say flat, but you know, uh -huh. condo, right? Uh, so you, you own your condo, but you don't. You own access to your condo. And when you buy it, you have this lease that's always kind of like ticking down from about 100 years. And then if it gets below 80 years in order to sell it, because you've got to kind of have 80 years on the lease or like no one will give you a mortgage, um, then you've got to pay money to somebody who owns the freehold who are usually domiciled in the, like the Jersey islands, like, you know, mm -hmm. offshore where they can't be taxed, even though it's still England. Um, and you know, for, for the privilege of continuing to go into your flat. And it's all just based on the fact that like the monarchy used to use everything right, right. and used to own everything. And in fact, it's mostly the monarchy that still owns it, but they won't let you know. So they mm -hmm. created this kind of like really, uh, labyrinthine system. So that you don't realize that literally it's still kind of like the same 20 families that wow. are most of the country. It's it's wild over here. There was never a revolution that stuck. And boy, how glorious. Revolution. You know, it was glorious, though. They, they had those wigs. <laughs> yeah. And that was pretty. You know, it's a real it's a real that one's a real heartbreaker for me because um, I hate Puritans. But also you're like, am I really supporting a king? I don't oh, no. Talk about so there's no know, good guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Choosing between two devils. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one one last thing, and this this risks being, you know, a a asking someone who, you know, is a doctor uh, why your knee hurts. Uh, <laughs> do you I, I've often wondered if there's a parallel between the United States breaking off of the British Empire and the Western and Eastern Roman empires uh, mm. and and. Could there then be a second medieval era 
that follows that's, that. You know, that, that that's a that's a really um, interesting way of putting it, because uh, to a certain extent, yes. Right. Because, you know, if what we say is that, you know, you have these two kind of like um, globe spanning colossuses eventually. So, you know, obviously when America breaks off, it's much smaller, mm-hmm. but, you know, it, it gets larger and it eats a lot of things up. Um, whereas, you know, England, well, I mean, even when that's happening, England is still getting bigger and bigger mm. and bigger. And they're like, yeah, I guess you can go because we're going to go take over in- India. OK, bye. You know, and yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's entirely within the realm of possibility. And I do think that we're kind of in the stage of finding that out in the States, because I think there's more and more interest in being smaller. Right. Because, you know, like I'm I'm originally from Seattle. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I, you know, talk to people in, oh, I don't know, um, Alabama, they're perfectly wonderful people. Right. But we don't have a whole lot in common culturally at all. Whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. It's like our, our food is different. Our slang is different. We talk differently. You know, there's all these these varying things. So the major stuff there is just like the government. And I mean, English, I guess, you know, yeah. you know sure. Um, and I do think this is something that we're going to find going forward. I've always kind of thought this. I think America is a little bit silly mm-hmm. um, as a concept. I just, as a historian, I don't see it working out. I don't see how you can like have this much land and this many people and keep them on side. And historically, I've never seen it really happen. Yeah. I mean, there's China, but um, China is much more... Even you had a you, lot of wars mm-hmm. to get to that yeah. point. Yeah, a lot of wars to get to that point, and people are not always happy about it. So, mm-hmm. you know, and and that also doesn't necessarily mean that I'm talking about like the the China that now exists on the map. Right? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. So, so um, I just don't think that I see this ever being possible. You know, and something can be successful and only be a couple hundred years old. But you know, it's interesting how time works, right? Because I've just flattened the medieval period in these numerous ways and said, oh, well, this is true. This is true over, you know, a course of, you know, 600 years or so. America's only been around for 200 and some, mm-hmm. you know, which is nothing. It's the blink of an eye, really, in terms of history. So we'll, we'll see, you know, I, but I, we're, it's tricky at the moment. I, think. I, I was fascinated uh, in, in the 90s. I read this book by a Washington Post reporter called The Nine Nations of North America, where he just mm. it was his qualitative observations that certain parts of North America resembled each other more than they did anything else. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. And so Seattle, for instance, was what he called ecotopia. And it shared more with Vancouver, Portland oh, yeah. and to the, you know, down to San Francisco than mm. it did with other parts of Washington, which were mm. more part of the empty quarter and more similar with Colorado and Wyoming. And, mm. and, and he had, he, he broke down all of those. And I, I've, I've found that to still be really useful in understanding mm. like, yeah, there's these regions, you know, Miami very much more similar to the islands of the Caribbean than oh, yeah. it is with the rest of Florida, for instance. Yeah. I, I mean, see, this is, you know, like a part of, one of the stories I, I tell about my own life is the worst culture shock I ever had in my life was um, I went and did my undergrad in Chicago. And I like I had all of the phases of culture shock, like the anthropological uh, conception of culture shock where I got ill. Um, I got kind of like frightened to go out. I was like calling my parents in tears and I was like, mm. I can't get sushi. And everyone keeps talking about baseball and I don't, <laughs> you know, and, and I was, and I, it was really, really shocking for me because I expected it to kind of be sure. the same. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, like when I moved to Japan, I expected Japan to be yeah. different. And I was like, no, oh, it's different. <laughs> you know, and, and there, there was sort of this expectation that, that, you know, if you go other places in America, it will be the same. And it's really not. It's, it's really very different. And which is one of the things that's great about it, obviously. But I just don't see how it can really hang together, you know, politically and culturally over the, the long durée. You mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. Um, it, I, I just don't know. I mean, shoot, I, I had, uh, 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 <laughs> I had culture shock going from Southern Illinois, growing up near St. Louis, Missouri, mm. to the University of Illinois, which was halfway to Chicago and full Ooh. of Chicagoans. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, so yeah, I can't imagine going Seattle to Chicago for sure. That's yeah. It was wild, you know. It was a, what a time to be alive. Yeah, you yeah. Know? But <laughs> all right, uh, let's finish up with a word game, if Ooh. if if you're willing. I am. All right, so it's called this or that. Uh, I just give you two words, and you tell me which you would pick and why. Okay. All right. Uh, we, we will start off historical and big thanks to our producer, Jen, who helped come up with these. Uh, Arthur or Lancelot? Oh, Lancelot, because I'm, I'm a sucker for a pretty boy. You know, mm-hmm. what can I say? Mm-hmm. You know, and he's he's dashing. He he is. And, and he's pretty on the inside. 
Mm-hmm. And, and you know what? Uh, like he he's one of those ones where, you know, he's willing to be bad in the right yeah. circumstances. So there you go. I am a big Arthur fan. I, actually, I like Arthur. Though. This, this yeah. is not this is not to downplay Arthur. Oh, I it's think a, yeah, is, it's not an either or. Well, it is. You know, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know it is, but you know, I'm just saying, like, I'm I'm not Arthur. If you're listening, <laughs> so take it personally. Well, he is a once and future king, so he might mm-hmm. be out there. Who knows? Yeah, isn't King Charles one of his names, Arthur? I think because they have like there, 17 yeah. names, so yeah, yeah. I think they it's probably all there, have yeah. Arthur. Uh, mm-hmm. Chaucer or Dante? Oh, Dante! Mm. I love Dante because I the thing that I absolutely love about Dante uh, is that I like how he's kind of the inventor of fanfic, and he's like, yeah, all of these philosophers would think that's cool, and everyone who's ever wronged me, they're in hell. And I think that that's <laughs> like it's so funny and petty, so and I absolutely I love it. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. total fanfic. You're right. It is. Yeah, that's it's amazing. Great. Uh, fast or slow zombies? Ooh, um, I'm old school and I like slow zombies. Um, I kind of like, but uh, I'm a big fan of the comic book, The Walking Dead mm-hmm. as well. And yep. that's got the slow zombies. And so I, I, I like them because I kind of like the the idea that, you know, the real monster is the humans. And, and that's what yeah. you get slow zombies, isn't it? Yeah. It's a it's a good one. So so it's about the story for you. You're mm-hmm. not worried yeah. about the actual zombies then. No, but I mean, like, I'm still from the Northwest. Like, I've got a plan. Right? <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I've n- I I still haven't read the last issue of The Walking Dead. Oh, yeah, it's good. I, I'm saving it. Mm. Like, yeah, I I did the same thing. Like, I bought I because I I got like the big chunky hardback mm-hmm. ones. I saved it for like six months because I was like, I don't want to do it. And then yeah, eventually, I just, I just broke down. It's too good. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Careless Whisper or Faith? Oh, damn! It's like a this is like a knife to my heart. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to go a careless whisper because, you know, when everybody be here in that sax solo, they just mm. lose their. Oh, oh, God. I mean, George Michael, I love you. Shout out to my patron saint. Um, it's all incredible. But the thing about careless whisper is my man wrote that at 17 years old. Wow. 17 years old, which is just offensive. That's some maturity. Yeah, exactly. And uh, for me, it's the <laughs> it's the silky smooth baseline after time can never mend, which goes boom. Boom, how could he know at seven? How did he know? Yeah, my man. Like what? Like he, he's he's you know one of the best to ever do it. Amazing guy. Now we love Faith. I'm not saying mm-hmm, that we don't, mm-hmm. but I feel like a Faith is just more um, a timeless bop that we can all get behind. Yeah. Whereas Careless Whisper, it's like it does kind of hit you. You, know? you do you know? You know what I was doing at 17 years old was playing drums on the song Faith in the pep band oh, at the side of the girls basketball yeah. game. There you go. Well, that's, that's not a bad way to go. I'm, I never got to play any George Michael in mar- marching band. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we, we had a, a, a woman named faith on our uh, <laughs> state championship faith Densmore. So we're Amazing. like, well, we have to play this. And it was out at the time it was new. And yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's incredible. I brilliant. love that. Yeah. That's good. Uh, savory or dessert crepes. Oof. Um, I'm going to go savory. I really like those savory crepes. Um, I really like it if you can go to like w- when you get a kind of like Norman or Breton place. And I like to get that kind of buckwheat crepe, mm-hmm. like put, put, put something, nice you know, and thick. Incre- yeah, nice and thick when they put the egg on top. And then you've got like a little, you know, a little Breton cider on the mm-hmm. side in, in the kind of like a uh, clay mug. Oh, I love that. Live That's, for I, that. I need to add hearty to the crepe thing. Is that, mm-hmm. Yeah. A yeah. I love crepe, that. People don't mm-hmm. realize, but it can happen. It, it sounds, can. It sounds really good. Mm. Dogs or cats? Oh, gosh, this is a really tricky one. Um, Because I'm like a big lover of both. Um, I have a cat, but that's because I live in London. Uh, But I'm going to have to say that uh, my heart goes with dogs because I grew up with Tibetan Mastiffs. And like, so for me, you know, like I I don't have dogs because I'm like, what I want is a dog that's the size of a horse. Mm -hmm. And I live in a little flat in London. And I, and if I can't have what I want, I'm (laughs) just going to have a cat. Now I have no idea if this is true, but I've heard, uh, that the smaller your place, the larger the dog, that smaller Mm. dogs need more room. So if you have a small place, maybe that justifies getting a very large dog. You can get certain dogs. So I, I've considered getting, for example, a Newfoundland because mm, they're the very lazy. Yeah. And, and they're, they I had one around. when I was a tiny baby and he was great. and I loved him very much. So yeah. I, I'm kind of like, you know, I could. But at the moment, I've got um, a small Manx cat that uh, rules the house. And so like everything is built around. Yeah. Her. Um, so, yeah. We have a, uh, a German Shepherd mix and a, a Border Collie mix. Uh, oh, and they're great, uh, but 
we previously lived in a condo and had a Rottweiler shepherd mix and the, and the same border collie and, and going up and down stairs to take it in and out just was not. It That's the thing, him, you know? Yeah, 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 exactly. So, I mean, I think that I would kind of have to have a smaller dog in here and then there would be all hell, hell would break loose with the cat and I just yeah. know it. So, yeah. It depends. Yeah. Like our dogs would not get along with a cat, but, but I, our old dog loved cats. Like it's just, it's yeah, weird. yeah. It's an interesting one too, because like growing up, you know, with my mastiffs and everything, we always had cats and they mm-hmm. basically were like, I do not see the cat. That, yeah. that was kind of their thing. They were like, the cat is below me until like, it doesn't if, exist. If, if another animal bothered the cat, then suddenly it would be like, Hey, what were you doing to my Pick cat? My I own cat. that cat. You know, like, yeah. And it's like, and then it was suddenly like an, an ownership thing. So it was quite interesting, but um, it all depends, doesn't it? Ale or stout? Oof. Ah. God, um, the, again, knife to my heart. I'm going to have to go ale because I love a bitter. Mm, mm-hmm. And you now ah. I, I do, I do like stout, you know, again, like, please don't take my Irish citizenship off me. I need this. <laughs> uh, it's not that I don't like stout, but you know, especially on a, you know, I'm looking outside. It's a really rainy night in London and I'm just thinking about going into the pub and you get that first, that first sip of a really good bitter. It, it's nice and biscuity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ah. I, I'm almost exactly the same way. You're singing my tune. Uh, mm-hmm. I love a stout, uh, a Murphy's, a Beamish. Uh, oh, I love Murphy's. Yeah, lo- mm-hmm. love all of those. Uh, but I really love a bitter. Like mm-hmm. I, I, a Fuller's is the best I can find here. Oh, but it's yeah, pretty it's, classic. it's tough. Yeah, it's tough in the states, but Fuller's is like it's not going to do you wrong. No, no, L- absolutely. Let me put it that way. But tell you what, next time if you if you're ever over here, what you're really looking for, you go to the Midlands and try to get a bass um, from the like oh, from, from the, the barrel. Source. Yeah, yeah. So like, so they do it like directly from. Oh, wow! Oof. I do yeah. like bass, but it's never as good here. No, it's never as good here. Like, yeah. uh, sorry, in the states, yeah, because yeah, yeah. Uh, it just it, uh, one of the things about ale is that it doesn't have a lot of preservatives in it, and so you got to kind of be close by. And yeah, that's just the way it is, you know. All right, final one: dry or humid? Uh, ooh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go dry if we're talking about heat mm-hmm. uh, because i really I'm, I'm not like a big heat girl but you know as i say i am from seattle and i live in london so i like rain mm-hmm. so if we're if we're kind of talking about cold i i almost kind of prefer wet because you know my my natural inclination is to live in a bog on a mountain okay and I'm, all right so yeah. but but the minute it's kind of if we're talking about like above 60 i'm all like it better be dry <laughs> all right i can't i can't take it so <laughs> got i will yeah. i will no. in the heat uh, there, it, it's a it, there's a, a gradient there where mm-hmm. it flips yeah. yeah yeah got it oh eleanor this was so much fun thank you for talking with me today <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope I didn't ramble too, too much. No, it was great. Uh, you didn't ramble at all. This was, this was wonderful. Uh, if folks want to find your books, your works, mm-hmm. where should they go? Yeah. So uh, you can find uh, for free my blog, which is going hyphen medieval dot com, where I write all about uh, medieval history and pop culture. But um, you can right now get my graphic uh, guide to the Middle Ages, which is called the Middle Ages, a graphic history. It's out now on Icon and coming out in January. I've got a brand new book, which is called The Once and Future Sex. And it is all about uh, women's roles in society in the medieval period and now. Um, and that's available to pre-order at the moment. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Eleanor. Thanks so much. And thanks to our producers, Jen Cutter and Anthony Lemos. And thank you for listening to this show and telling your friends about it. You can get an ad free version of this show with ACAST Plus. Click on access exclusive content at awordpodcast.com. We'll have a word with you next time. 